Thank you for being here. It's good to be here among people and not watching a screen. I think for the, some of you, it's the first time that you see physical activists again. I think that's a, a great experience. What I want to talk, to, uh, talk about today is um, a bit of, um, well, an emotional story maybe, or an insight in the emotional life of an activist that is um, hopefully recognizable uh, to you. So um, the introduction made me feel quite old, um, but that's just uh, a fact. I think I have been indeed 25 years um, involved in um, activism. My story started when I was 10, when I was considering uh, the dog that was uh, lying near the fireplace and uh, the cows that were grazing in the rain in the meadow across the street. And I was wondering, okay, I'm petting the dog and I'm eating the cow. What is the morally relevant difference that explains for me, that justifies for me that I treat these animals so differently? And I couldn't um, find any difference. So what did I do? I continue to eat meat for a long time uh, until um, at the university I read this book by Peter Singer, Animal Liberation. That was what kind of, me, kind of got me uh, over the line because before that I was really the biggest meat eater you can imagine. My mom was health conscious and she tried to make macrobiotic and vegetarian dishes now and then I was I was protesting I was a pro meat activist back in that time until I read this and then uh, I wrote my thesis at the university about this topic uh, and uh, when I graduated I wanted to find a job uh, I applied to what the one animal rights organization in Belgium they didn't want me so I went to the US to do internships for half a year and um, you can see a picture here of my internship back in 98 at PETA. Uh, you see there me in the middle with a Meat is Murder t-shirt. Um, I still have that. I still wear it under my shirt. Um, not openly. Uh, and the friends I made back then, they're still friends uh, of me today. So that's more than, um, than 25 years later. I almost didn't uh, get home because uh, five days before my flight, I was uh, arrested. Uh, I was involved in a PETA demonstration where we put uh, bales of hay, we put them on fire on the uh, Capitol steps, on the, the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. And uh, so uh, cops interrogated me. It was just like in the movies, like a good cop and a bad cop, and the good cop had actually a bag of carrots for me. <laughs> and the bad cop said I would end up in a prison that was really, really bad. <laughs> so I was, I was scared, I have to say, but... They let me go and I got on my flight and at home I started or I co-founded the organization called EVA, Ethical Vegetarian Alternative. Fifteen years later, I had a burnout. This is not me, but it could be me. Um, I had a burnout from, I call it, from leadership, from trying to lead people. Um, not from the cause exactly, but from um, trying to make decisions all the time, etc. And uh, I was at home for a while. I was quite depressed for, I think, half a year. And then um, I kind of reinvented myself as a, an activist who is more of a meta-activist, who talks to other uh, activists. Um, I co-founded some organizations, and my own brand is The Vegan Strategist. And I wrote uh, also this book, like was mentioned, uh, which has been translated now in, um, in 11 languages. And now I live together with my girlfriend on the countryside, and we have um, a mini sanctuary and uh, also bed and breakfast, people can stay there. This is a, this is a, a painting on, on the bed and breakfast building. Um, this is my girlfriend here, uh, and we, uh, she rescues uh, mainly chickens. So chickens get rescued from a factory farm, they brought to us and we adopt them out and we uh, give them new uh, lives. So that's, uh, that's where I am. Um, I wouldn't say end of career, but uh, late career. Um, late career. Um, about 50 years old. And it brings me today to, uh, to a question that I have. And the question was raised uh, just one week ago um, when we were having a, a barbecue, a vegan barbecue with uh, friends and ex-colleagues. And um, it was all very light and funny. Um, but um, at some point, my girlfriend there 
on the left, she at some point said, um, I don't believe in it anymore. I just saved the chickens, um, but I don't think it's ever going to happen, and I just try to do good for these creatures right here. And it was, it was hard for me to hear um, that somebody like her wouldn't believe anymore. And she was also affecting and influencing negatively, I think, the other people that were there. So I wanted to find an answer to people who don't believe. And the first thing I had to do was ask the question if I believe. This was also at the moment when um, this happened. Have you seen that? So Freya is a walrus who visits different countries. In Norway, she uh, was quite a public attraction. People um, wanted to be on pictures with her uh, because she trashed or she sunk little boats. And so people liked that and they wanted to be on pictures and they, they got quite close to her. And the government said, we can't guarantee the safety of these people because they get too close to this big animal. So what do you do if people are so stupid? What do you do? You kill the walrus. That's what they did. That was a horrible story. And I saw then um, a poem by Paul Watson who said, Freya made the mistake of trusting humanity. She had no idea of our collective insanity. So the question I was asking at that point was, do I still trust humanity? Do I still trust people? Do I believe in people? And it's not just them, the meat eaters and the hunters and whoever, but it's also people are also us as a movement and then me, myself. That's what I wanna, wanna talk about, these three levels. And you can look at yourself to what extent you trust, you believe, people, the movement, and yourself. So I think it's not always easy to believe, certainly not in them, right? This is um, a cartoon that may sum up a very negative attitude towards uh, people. You can see it, it's quite disturbing, I think. And at the same time, realistic, maybe. I'll promise you that I'll end on a positive note so you don't have to be pressed. And there's these people doing these strange things that like, I mean, you can understand people eating meat, but people torturing animals like that. And people paying to watch other people torture animals. I mean, that is, that is so hard to grasp and so hard to understand and then there's these like even people in leadership or ex-leadership or maybe future leadership that are horrible people like this guy have you ever heard of him steve king he's a, like a republican in the u.s and he's he's fortunately not a representative anymore but he supported dog fights and cock fights and polar bear hunting and all kinds of disgusting things. And also on a, on a more, on a broader level, um, there was this, this, um, this is also a nice example, I think there was this um, big uh, investor who also had a stake in McDonald's and his daughter is a vegan, I think, and he tried to push McDonald's to adopt more humane welfare standards for animals. And the shareholders voted against that because it would bite into the bottom line. It would make them less money. And of course, we know that happens all the time, but you see it black on white in an example like that, people being confronted with like, this is something we can do for animals and people saying, no, because it's gonna make us less money. It's pretty disgusting. It, I think humans are kind of at the worst when they defend things that are indefensible. And also when they sabotage the people trying to do something about it. Those are the people that I think in the future are going to be most ashamed. This um, is a bit of a disturbing image. This is a chicken that we saved or that my girlfriend saved. She was found, her name is Gloria. Uh, she was found stuck to a grill in a factory farm. She couldn't move. She was stuck to that. And her paws, her legs were like that. It was like caked uh, manure, shit, caked to her legs that she couldn't get off. And so when we got her at home, when she was freed, she couldn't walk because of those things. So my girlfriend washed her and fed her and now she's walking around again. 
what I want to say with that story is like just one example, being confronted with one example of such a creature that can suffer, that can experience misery and well-being, that makes you realize what is at stake and how big the stakes are because there's billions of beings like her. And at the same time, and I think you must feel it like I do, we see all these people not caring, right? And I see it, I, I find it especially weird when I see people like, 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 I see images like this, like people enjoying an animal dinner and they're like happy and toasting and drinking wine and forgetting what is there on their plate. And I think it, it creates, for me, a sense of alienation from them. Like I don't understand what's happening. I understand like how can this be happening? And I want to take a bit of time to explore this feeling of alienation because I think it's interesting to try to understand. And I think nobody has captured it as well as um, the South African author, Nobel Prize winner, Kutsi, um, who has written a couple of books on this topic. Um, and I'm going to read you a couple of quotes and, and, and try to let them really sink in and really feel them. This is a, the main person who's a vegetarian in the book. And she says about her society, I seem to move around perfectly easily among people, to have perfectly normal relations with them, is it possible, I ask myself, that all of them are participants in a crime of stupefying proportions? Am I fantasizing at all? I must be mad. Yet every day I see the evidence, corpses, fragments of corpses that they have bought for money. Calm down, I tell myself. You are making a mountain out of a molehill. This is life. Everyone else comes to terms with it. Why can't you? Why can't you? One last one. It's as if I were to visit friends and to make some polite remark about the lamp in their living room. And they were to say, yes, it's nice, isn't it? Polish Jewish skin it's made of. We find that's the best. The skins of young Polish Jewish virgins. And then I go to the bathroom and the soap wrapper says, Treblinka. 100% human steward. Am I dreaming? I say to myself, what kind of house is this? Is this recognizable for you? This feeling of like, what is this world that we live in? How can this be happening? Another image that was very confrontational for me and very evocative of this feeling of alienation. It's a bit graphic, but... but um... So this was an image from a journalist who wrote a travel story, published it in a newspaper, and he put his own pictures there of his own family. This is his daughter. This is the daughter of the journalist who wrote the article. And for me, it was like, <laughs> how do you want to picture your, your daughter like this in a magazine, in a newspaper? I'm sure that at some point, they will look back and be ashamed and embarrassed. But today, this is, this is normal. This is a normal picture, apparently. This is a very powerful quote, I think. We are haunted by the horror of what we do to animals, but we are equally haunted by the knowledge of how unhaunted others are. This is also by Jim Kutsi. So these feelings of alienation that can lead to a lot of negativity, I think a negative view of humanity. I think this is an extremely powerful quote. Hell is empty and all the devils are here. Have you ever thought that? The idea that they all came here, the devils, the demons. Anger. I have what I call my falling down moments. Falling down is a movie that I would recommend with Michael Douglas if you haven't seen it. Somebody who loses it at some point. At some point, I, sometimes I feel like taking a flamethrower to the planet. And... Anger, but also hurt. And I think that the tragedy is that the more we care, the more it will hurt. And the risk is that we stop caring to protect ourselves. I think that's the last thing we should do. Frustration, obviously, with the fact that things are not going fast enough. You heard Peter also talk about the uh, rising numbers somewhere else on the planet, in Asia, etc. 
the blindness of people. By the way, the images I'm using are made by artificial intelligence. I, I made this in one minute to just, just, just to make you think about what AI is going to be and do in the future. It's really worth thinking about. So the blindness or how meat blinds us to care about animals, people that don't want to know, and also something I find particularly frustrating is not just the damage that people do to animals, that's bad enough, but there is also the fact that we have to clean it up for them. Like, my girlfriend also runs a cat organization, and she gets confronted with abandoned cats all the time. That's terrible enough that people do that, that people put a cat on the side of the street in a bag, but then it's the good people who are left with the business of cleaning it up, of finding solutions for, for their shit. That's very frustrating. It's also, this is the second part, not always easy to believe in us. So, the thing I have always wanted to do in my years of activism was to build a bigger tent. Like, broaden the idea of animal rights and veganism so that more people can join. Maybe this is a good way to summarize it. We don't need a handful of vegans eating plant-based food perfectly. We need millions of people doing it imperfectly. It's kind of like something I really believe in. So I've always emphasized that we have to look at results. We have to be pragmatic. We don't have to be dogmatic. We don't have to be like overly focusing on being the perfect vegan. And that, of course, has um, created a couple of enemies for me. Um, this is still the banner on my Facebook page. I use it as an advertisement for my book, a book everyone should avoid, signed by a guy who calls himself the vegan police. This is just, just for comic relief. Um, uh, a quote from somebody uh, on their Facebook page about me. Um, so they call me um, all kinds of things um, that I'm only interested in making money, etc., etc. So these things, they don't really touch me so much personally anymore, um, but they make one disappointed sometimes in, in the movement. Like if, if you do your best to change things for animals and you write a book, and I can tell you writing a book does not get you any money, um, but then people think that you do it for money, that is kind of like disappointing that people can think like that. Here is another thing that they made. Um, interview with me on slitting hardliners throats and being vegan for the humans being i think i've always been vegan for the animals but um yeah some people see that differently so the solution is very simple here you know like if people get on your nerves and are, are really of bad will bad intentions then i i just block them and i think blocking people should be not something you think twice about if people really are unproductive and toxic, etc. Just ban them from both your physical and your online life. Sometimes the movement reminds me a bit of this scene. Do you know this scene in Life of Brian? So, uh, so these are <laughs> activists from the Judean People's Front, and this guy comes along and he says, "Are you the People Front of Judea?" And these guys say, "Like the People Front of Judea? No, we're the, we're the Judean People Front." And you see the hostility of very similar groups that are both fighting the Romans at that time. We are all fighting the animal abusers, I guess. Um, but still, sometimes there are conflicts among ourselves. And I think that um, we should overcome those and we should be one front. And, and also, again, the emphasis on being the perfect human or trying to like spot a non-vegan or like being the vegan police, there's for every vegan you can find, there's another vegan who's more vegan. That is um, a silly game to play, so let's not, not play that game. And then there's all these different questions in our, um, in our movement which are very relevant and which are very good to think about and worthwhile, but they sometimes seem to divide us, right? So there too, um, sometimes I get disappointed on, on how we... Um, how we fight about all these things, how we identify with all these different variations and ideologies, etc. Um, and it's true, it's just not easy. It's not, just not easy when you have such a big group of passionate people who believe in a lot of stuff, who really want to, to make the world better. Um, it's going to happen. 
that we differ in opinion about things that we feel really passionate about. And then also the uh, irrationality sometimes uh, that I see, like this, um, this is a, an, something somebody made against um, cell-based beat, you know, like the idea that cell-based beat is, is for profit and still kills animals and things like that, etc., etc. So quite irrational stuff. And then the third part is it's also even not always easy to believe in myself. And I don't, oops, I don't know how that is for you, but for me, um, for instance, I compare myself to others. I will look at the impact others have. I was at a, 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 a vegan festival the other day and uh, I gave a talk there and right before me there was like a, a famous celebrity chef that has 1.5 million followers on YouTube and afterwards the people were like streaming to get uh, signatures and things like that. And I feel that. My ego, my childish part feels that. Like I compares myself to that person. And I think like, oh, how stupid, you know? There's nothing to be worried about or envious about, but still there is, or it generates a feeling of not doing enough. So that can be sometimes painful. There's also doubt. I have left my organization as a leader, I think, because I just doubted too much. As a leader, you have to at least pretend you are sure about some things. You have to show that, okay, we're going to take this decision. Um, and even if you're not sure, you have to pretend you're sure, or sure enough. I never could do that. I'm better at philosophizing and thinking, I think, than at leading an organization. So that was one of the reasons I left. And another was perfectionism. Perfectionism is one of those things, like if you ask in a job interview, can you name me a negative quality that you have? And people will say perfectionism, you know, like because that's, that's actually a good quality disguised as a bad one. But in my case, it was really a bad one. It was like an obsessive compulsive thing of like trying to structure everybody's work and it was really not pleasant for my, for my staff. So we can recognize all this, all these problems with people, with the movement, with ourselves, but recognizing them is not the same as dwelling on them. It's not the same as wallowing in them. So we have to recognize, but to some extent forget. And so here we come to the, to the more upbeat part. I do want to believe, not in aliens like Fox Mulder. I mean, I believe in aliens, but this is not relevant here. Uh, and also, yeah, I believe in animals, but I don't believe that there's ever going to be a cow rebellion. So we have to believe in people. There's no other option. We have to believe in people, in our movement, and in ourselves. And we have to because I don't think, like I said, there is no other option. Optimism is a moral duty. If we're optimistic, we, we can recruit more people, and we can be more sustainable ourselves in our activism. Right? Otherwise, it's going to be hard for us. So, some reasons to be optimistic, some signs that things are really changing. This is one of the most inspiring and hope-giving things I've seen lately, I think. This is a poll by the BBC that shows that among kids of 5 to 16 years old, 8% is already vegan, 13% is already vegetarian. And another 15% wants to be vegan and 21% wants to be vegetarian. So, that together is already 55, 60% of the population in that demographic. That is spectacular. I hope that is a good survey. I hope it is replicable in other countries. Also inspiring is that some of the really smart and influential people in the world are on the animal side. I think you all know Yuval Noah Harari from Sapiens and Homo Deus. He's like the, the rock star intellectual of today. And he says, animals are the main victims of history and the treatment of domestic animals in industrial farms is perhaps the worst crime in history. Those are really big words. And coming from him, I think they're really meaningful and they can have really a lot of impact on other people in influential positions. This is also interesting. People working within the meat industry in France and Germany they are generally apparently more open to not eating meat than the general population. Probably not because they care about animals, but in this case because they care about food safety. They see what's going on 
in those slaughterhouses and processing plants, and they are eating less meat than the others. This is also inspiring. It's um, a research by ProVeg Netherlands, and they asked the different political parties, those are all political parties, they asked them different, um, their position on different um, ideas. For instance, reducing the amount of animals and a higher price for meat, etc. And the green things are where they agreed. And you see that there's a lot of green here. A lot of political parties agreeing with a lot of quite controversial stances. The Netherlands is a pretty progressive country, but still. Governments are also, I think, waking up and giving more, spending more and more money on this transition. It's just beginning. It's just still small, but like in the Netherlands also, they gave 60 million for a cell-based um, ecosystem. Businesses are waking up. IKEA here wants to reduce um, or wants to have 80% of its packaged food offerings and meals to be plant-based in a couple of years. And they actually doing stuff for that. See, the hot dog, the vegan one, half as cheap as the original one. I think you've seen this in Austria, Burger King asking, do you want the normal Whopper or the meat-based Whopper? That's really great. That's changing what is normal. Next step should be, do you want the normal Whopper or the slaughter-based Whopper, right? I don't know if they're going to do that. This is uh, something in the Netherlands, a company that was originally called Yogurt Barn because they had all kinds of yogurt products. They shifted to plant-based, and now they can't call themselves Yogurt Barn anymore, so they're called YB. So entirely plant-based business now for sustainability and animal reasons. I think also there's a lot of faith or inspiration to be gotten out of what we are doing technologically, right? New technologies, cell-based, cultured, um, fermented, and also plant-based new technologies like 3D printing. I think that technology, and this is also what I, what I discussed with Peter this morning, um, technology could be the revolution that precedes, there, there could be a technological revolution that precedes a moral revolution. So I think a lot is riding on that. And also I think it's just, the problem is just too big not to change. That's the irony. This problem is so huge and so horrible that it cannot but change. You know, there is the fact that we're using the surface of South America and Africa together for the production of animal products. That's an incredible statistic, I think. There's the fact that it contributes to every major environmental problem, pandemics now also, and of course, animal suffering. I think that in order to believe a bit more in people, we have to realize that we are early. And in every change in society, the adoption of new technology, the adoption of new food, whatever, in every space, there are slow people and there's fast people. You are the fast people, right? Other people are going to be slower. There is no way around that. There is no way around the fact that people move at different rhythms, different paces. And I have some Jesus-level tips as well. And they sound religious. They should not be interpreted as religious. But I think that if you can think of them now and then, when you are in a phase that you're particularly disgusted with humanity or with somebody, these might help. The first is, those who deserve love the least need it the most. The people who do the most horrible things, they probably are more in need of love and support and compassion than others. It's not what we do in society. We just put them in prison and we withdraw all the love and all the support. They need more of it. The second is, there but for the grace of God go I. Do you understand that? So it's a, it, it is a religious sounding statement, but it means that it could have been me. That person doing that thing, it could have been me. If I had been born with different parents in a different part of the world, with a different environment, with different genetics, I might have done that. So to some extent, it's a bit of luck. That's what is meant by the grace of God, the luck, fate. And the third is the true test of compassion 
may not lie in how we behave towards the weakest, but towards the worst. That's when we can show ourselves to be the most compassionate, when we relate compassionately to people who do bad things. It will be more easy for us, and it will be probably more productive in our relationships toward them and in making them change. If all else fails, I recommend this book by the Dutch author Rutger Bregman, Humankind, A Hopeful History. This is, you cannot come away from this book with a negative image of humanity. Um, it is something that will, I think, inspire you. And then in us, I think there's so many people doing such wonderful things, entrepreneurs, but also, and I've been all over the world, people like you, you know, people doing wonderful things and people being very, very motivated. And in ourselves, I think that we can do a lot better as persons as well. And I've, in other talks, I've talked about different ingredients to be better activists and better people. Open-mindedness, empathy, rationality, and positivity are some of the, the main contenders, I think, that we could do better in as individuals and as a movement. And I think also we can be grateful or try to be grateful for what we have and what we are. I think we can be grateful for the fact that we care. Care is also the title of this conference. Because if we don't care, nothing is going to change even though caring can hurt. I think we have to be grateful for the community that we have. It's not so obvious that you can go anywhere in the world and find a community of vegans or animal rights people and connect with them. Not everybody has that. And thirdly, for the sense of mission that we have and the fire that we feel. Having a mission in your life is not something you can choose. It just happens to you. And if you have it, I think you have to be to consider yourself lucky. And as for that fire that I hope you feel, you have to kindle it and not take it for granted. Because at some point, it might be lower or it might be gone. So try to keep that alive with the help of your community. Many of you are quite young and you have a whole life ahead of you. And maybe you want to make a trip around the world first, and you can do that. But I hope that when you come back from that trip, or right now, if you already have not, if you haven't already, you make a choice to have really a significant and impactful career. Not just a hobby, but a career. You can join an NGO or a company that does something good in the world. You can be, like Peter said, a scientist or a lawyer. And you can also found your own startup. This is a coffee cup and a laptop that shows startup, right? <laughs> and I, I've seen during the pandemic that there were thousands of new online startups, online shops every day. Thousands. And most of these people starting new businesses are offering things that you say like, why do we need that? And they talk about it in grandiose terms, like keep on growing. You know what keep on growing is about? Beards. <laughs> These are people selling beard products. This is your life in months if you get 90 years old. I'm here. You are maybe here. Maybe you ha now have to choose your career. Do you want the rest of your active career to be like this. It could be worse, it could be like this. It could end there. And you've, sell, you've sold beard products, beard gels for all of your life. I don't want you to do that. I want you to pick something meaningful. I want you to not get off track. I know most of you won't start a stupid startup selling stupid products. But it is quite possible that you're very committed now and devoted and an activist, but it's possible that you get sidetracked by life, by kids, by whatever. I hope for most of you 
that's not the case. I hope that some of you can say, looking back, that maybe this conference was the time when you said, when you decided that you would devote the rest of your life to animals, to them. Thank you very much for everything that you do. Now for the questions. So the first question is, uh, you said to block toxic people. Uh, so where is the line between being compassionate towards others and trying to talk to them uh, about animal suffering and uh, between ending the discussion altogether? It's, it's a good question. It's hard to know where the line is. Um, and you can, be, you can try to continue to be compassionate, but you have to realize that um, you also might be wasting your time and it could be used for, for better things. Um, I think it, it can always be compassionate, but you can also compassionately close the discussion. You can also say, I'm sorry, this is the end. And I think most of the time you will know when there's no progress, when people continue. And in my case, I was talking about people who say like really mean things, intentionally mean things, who lie very clearly, etc. I mean, in that case, it's clear. In other cases, it might be less clear, but uh, yeah. So another question is, uh, so how can you manage, what, what are the techniques for managing the anxiety you have? And from my end, uh, maybe you talked about the story of walrus and like the very sad story that like made you uh, depressed basically, at least slightly. So how many uh, s stories do you take in? Do you constantly k keep your ear on the close to the grass to, to hear every single story or do you close off and think like, okay, I know, I know that humans uh, cause animals suffering and I don't need to know every yeah. single example of that. To some extent, you can indeed say that. You can say like, I know what's happening. I don't need to hear it again. I find that, I mean, in general, I don't want to know a lot. Like also what happens in our mini sanctuary. My girlfriend knows not to tell me certain things because I can't stand it. Um, and on the other hand, now and then I also feel that it fires me up when I see something, when I read something, when I, when I read about some atrocity, um, sometimes I decide to recommit or to like to, look, to put even more effort in. So you have to judge that for yourself to what extent some cruelty or some, some negativity will motivate you perhaps to some extent or will put you down. I think that's, that's different for, for every person. I myself, I usually avoid. And also to answer this question, um, I, I often will go look for something, something positive in the story. Like, I mean, with Freya, it's disgusting, but there was so much upheaval against it, so much protest against this thing. And of course, these are also people who eat chicken and fish, etc. so it's very selective. But still, the fact that people are saying like, shame on you, Norway or whatever, and, and, and this should never have happened, and this is stupid, that, that is a positive thing. The fact also that it's spread all around the world, thanks to the internet, is also, I think, a positive thing. Yeah, but, uh, and once you feel like this anxiety and depression, the question also like asked uh, how you deal with that, like yeah. afterwards. Yeah, I have, I have episodes of depression that lasts a couple of days, uh, now and then, but this is like something that comes from somewhere, like somebody turns off a switch in me. And in that case, I have to just wait till it's over. <laughs> I cannot do anything else. Um, so um, it's like being sick and saying like, I will, I will heal at some point. This, the fever is going to go away at some point. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, understandable. So, uh, so also someone asked that uh, you are criticizing the movement for policing other vegans. Uh, and like, they asked basically, how can we, how should we like police other vegans and keep the movement like on the straight path and be also inclusive of uh, all types of vegans? Yeah. So what, what this question says, am I not doing the same thing by calling the abolitionist vegans irrational or counterproductive? There is some truth in that, and I have done some things that I, that I wouldn't do anymore. Um, 
And today my stance is more like, like really, I want, I want this, the diversity of opinions mm -hmm. and I want people within our movement to respect the other interventions that we don't necessarily agree with. And um, I want us to mainly trust that we're all in it for the right reasons. If we trust each other, if we trust that this other person, even though they may differ about the strategy and the road towards the goal, the goal is still the same. The goal is to help animals. That's, that's what I try to remember and I, I, I have steered away from, from criticizing people that have different tactics lately, the last couple of years or so. Yeah, that's, that makes sense. Uh, so, and we wonder also, uh, how do you see AI being a potentially harmful or useful tool in the movement over the coming years? Yeah, this, uh, it's an important question, but I'm, I'm not a specialist. I, I can only say that we might be very surprised and it's hard to see what is coming. I hadn't seen, this is also a picture created by AI. Um, I hadn't seen it coming. I mean, you can literally now enter a phrase and, and there will be a beautiful picture one minute later. I was like blown away. Um, I thought that the creative um, jobs were safe for AI, but apparently not. Um, so um, yeah, all of a sudden this is there. Um, so it can go very fast. Um, I can see a future in which we can actually, um, I mean, we will live to see that, in which we can actually ask an AI like, find me a solution for animal suffering and it will bring up interesting things. It will, it will bring up ideas that maybe we haven't thought about. Um, I think that's, that's going to happen. So that's, that's the positive part. Um, yeah, I, I think for, for our cause, I mainly see positive things. Um, what Peter said also is like within the EA movement, a lot of resources go to, to this um, risk. And um, that means less resources probably for animals. So there's a bit of a, a negative factor, I think. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I'm, I'm not enough of a specialist to, to have a very strong opinion about it. Yeah, like automating slaughterhouses, like we don't know what's... what's How do you what? Automating slaughterhouses, like we don't know, like what's, what's the effect on a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so maybe on a positive note, like maybe you can talk about uh, more to the sanctuary you have. So To the what? To the sanctuary, about the sanctuary you have. Yeah. You spoke about. So someone is asking, how many chickens do you have in the sanctuary? Uh, how did you manage to save them from, from the from a slaughterhouse, uh, and did you have any legal consequences because yeah. of that? So, 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 we, so the sanctuary, it's two and a half hectares of forest that we have. And uh, just let me tell you, one, one, you asked for positive, but this was annoying. Uh, so we had all these chickens there and all these animals and two pigs and, and other animals. And, we, and my girlfriend made a lot of sheds and fences for them, etc. And one day the government was at our door not so long ago, two months ago, and they said all these animals have to go um, because this is a forest and you cannot keep any animal in a forest. That's the law in Belgium. And so we were pretty devastated. And fortunately, we found a solution with uh, two neighbors. One of them is vegetarian. The other one is an anti-vegetarian. But we can, we can use their land and our animals are now next to us on the land. And uh, we hope that at some point they can go back. Uh, but so we found a good solution. But, but this, this just shows that like there is, like if you want to rescue animals, it's hard to even find a place for them. You know, the, the chickens live in a forest, but they're not supposed to live there. They're supposed to live in a factory farm, apparently. Anyway, um, we have about, uh, yeah, we, we had to slim down in terms of animals. But what happens is that we get chickens from um, factory farms that are rescued. We also have uh, people from factory farms who tell us at the moment that the chickens are being caught to bring to the slaughterhouse, there's also always dozens that escape and it takes more time to catch them than they're worth. So the ones that escape, we can come and get them and then we adopt them out. Um, so it's, it's uh, I don't know, it's hundreds a year that my girlfriend um, helps like that. Yeah, maybe a thousand or something, I'm, I'm not sure. We, so, I think that's the end, so, uh, we, so thank you so much again, thank you guys, and it was a wonderful lecture, and uh, see you soon. Thank you.